Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is EP 2.2.44, Made Simple on Teledyne Techmars Fusion. Our presenter is Joy Osborne, Technical Product Manager for Teledyne Techmar. We will be taking questions, so feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation using the question feature. Those questions will be addressed at the end of Joy's presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing within a couple of days. You will receive an email notification of its availability. Now I'll turn it over to our presenter, Joy Osborne. Thank you for that introduction, Shelley. Today we'll be presenting live EP2244 Made Simple on Teledyne Techmars Fusion as part of TAX e-learning webinar series. And just so you know, TAX is includes um, Teledyne Hastings, SeekTech, Lehman Labs, and Techmar. The agenda for the webinar will be an, an introduction and explanation of European Pharmacopoeia, or EP 2.244, with comparison to United States Pharmacopoeia method, uh, 643. <clears throat> um, we'll also talk about Fusion's uh, workflow simplifying software features and the features that are directed at the pharmaceutical industry. And then we'll go into a guide to running EP 2.244 on the Fusion, then ultimately real world results with EP 2.244 on the Fusion. All right, so here's the introduction to EP 2.244. Um, if you actually look at the method, it's only about a page, so I I strongly employ you to, um, you know, read it, but here's a little synopsis of what is in it. Basically, it qualifies the TOC analysis system through a system suitability test. So basically, any TOC technique can be utilized, and by technique, I mean like oxidation type technique. Um, so if you can use a membrane conductivity system, you can use a combustion system, you can use a UV persulfate system like we did for this study. Um, you compare the recovery of half a ppm of carbon from sucrose to half a ppm of carbon of 1,4-benzoquinone. Um, your reagent water must be less than 100 parts per billion carbon, uh, which most deionized and reverse osmosis water systems qualify. Um, the reason you use sucrose and 1,4-benzoquinone is because sucrose is an easy-to-oxidize compound while 1,4-benzoquinone is a difficult to oxidize compound. So this will ensure that you can oxidize all types of organic carbon molecules, including a lot of the large molecules used in the pharmaceutical industry. The compound responses of sucrose and 1,4-benzoquinone are then ratioed, and they need to come out similar. And this ratio is called a response efficiency, and this must be between 85 to 115%, meaning that the results for sucrose and 1,4-benzoquinone need to be within 85 and 115% of each other. And it validate, validates that difficult to oxidize samples oxidize fully on the system up to 0.5 ppm carbon concentration. So if you're doing concentrations above 0.5 ppm, which is not, which is unusual for the pharmaceutical industry, then this method actually will not qualify it for it. We'll talk about that a little bit further on. All right, this is the formula given in EP2244. Um, so you're given this equation, and basically it's just taking your system suitability solution, which is your difficult to oxidize 1,4-benzoquinone. You're subtracting out your reagent water, which should be less than 100 ppb. And then you're doing it with your sucrose solution, your calculated response of sucrose minus the calculated response of your reagent water, and then you're timing it by 100 to make it a percentage. So EP 2.244 is entitled Total Organic Carbon and Water for Pharmaceutical Use. So here are some uh, pharmaceutical applications that are common. You have water for infection, which is extremely pure water without significant amounts of contamination. 
It is, it is used for injections into veins and muscles that are under the skin. Purified water, which is used for formulating pharmaceuticals or cleaning equipment. And then we have cleaning validation. The FDA mandates cleaning validation of all equipment used to manufacture pharmaceuticals pre prevent contamination. So things like cross-contamination from one batch to the other, or even like foreign contamination like dust, bacteria, things like that, which can all be picked up through TOC analysis. So for this for this application, all these are very clean, low TOC applications. It's extremely important to have an accurate and sensitive instrument. So I put together this slide um, because I was curious how the European pharmacopoeia method compared to the United States pharmacopoeia method. Um, at first, if you read them both, they're very similar except there's one big exception. Um, back in 2013, the United States Pharmacopeia added a section on sterile water. So sterile water has a much higher concentration of TOC than purified water and those other applications we just talked about. So this helps validate methods up to eight parts per million of carbon. So you, they actually added a 8, PM, 8 ppm carbon standard of sucrose and 1,4-benzoquinone. So then you're validating it up to 8 ppm, that you're able to oxidize of that difficult compound 1,4-benzoquinone. Um, we do have another application note on USP 643 if you're curious to learn more. Um, it's Either you can click on this link in the slide or you can check it out on our website. All right, so the apparatus requirements, I'm talking about your TOC system that are required by EP 2.244. It's actually very vague. There isn't a lot of stipulations here. All it really says, it must be able to produce carbon dioxide. So it can use any oxidation um, technique to, you know, convert that C, that organic carbon to CO2. It must be able to discriminate between or organic and inorganic carbon. However, it doesn't say if you have to use TC minus IC or TOC. It actually says you can use either one. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. So as long as the instrument can meet the system suitability test, the technique is not important. All right, so let's talk about benefits of TOC over TC minus IC. So EP 2.244 permits both TOC or uh, TC minus IC. Um, the Fusion is capable of doing either TOC or TC minus IC. It has methods for both pre-programmed in, into it. But I chose TOC for the study. Um, the reason is it's twice as fast. You're only taking one measurement, TOC instead of two measurements, one for TC, one for IEC. And the other reason, which is a little more complicated, um, but I will try to explain it in detail, is that it has less error in the analytical results, especially for samples that are high in inorganic carbon. So uh, to kind of show this, um, I use a theoretical sample, so we're going to say in the sample there is 50 parts per billion of total organic carbon. There's 100 parts per billion of inorganic carbon. So altogether, the total carbon is 150 ppb. Now, um, no matter how good your instrument is, you're going to have a little bit of error, like 1 to 2 percent, just from one replicate to the other. Um, so let's go through that. So let's calculate that out. So if we do a TC minus IC with this theoretical sample, the error of TC can be up to 2.5 parts per billion. So there can be up to 2.5 parts per billion of error in that TC reading. So for that 150, if you apply that 2%, you could actually get a reading from anywhere from 147.5 to 152.5 
parts per billion for the same sample. And since you know you typically run in triplicate or several replicates, you could get anywhere from you know anywhere in this range for those results. Now let's do that for IC, so a two percent um, error on a hundred for IC is two ppb. So you theoretically could get anywhere from ninety-eight to one hundred and two for the same sample reading. So here, when you add those two um, errors together, is where you get this huge range. So the for the same sample, the max result you could get is fifty-four point five ppb. And the minimum result you could get is 45.5. So you have this huge range that you could get for the same sample. It's almost 10 ppb for a 50 ppb sample, so that's almost 20% if you think about it. Now let's do that with a TOC measurement. Now you're only doing one measurement, so that error is only factored in once. So the most you could get is one ppb, so you're looking at a range for 49.51. So this is much more precise than if you do TC minus IC, and it's also um, twice as fast. Some people would argue that, you know, since you're doing TC and IC, the TC part isn't purging, but there's a lot of cleanup in between TC and min minus IC, so it really does work out to be about twice as fast on POC. All right, so we chose the Fusion for this study. The Fusion is a TOC analyzer with UV per sulfate oxidation, followed by non-dispersive infrared detection. You can actually see on the front here is the lamp, so that's where it's getting its oxidation power along with sodium per sulfate to help oxidize that carbon, organic carbon in the sample. The reason we chose the fusion was it's because it has great sensitivity, accuracy, and precision due to the UV per sulfate oxidation technique. Um, and that is because UV per sulfate oxidation has less contamination than combustion oxidation, since there's no use of catalyst. So catalyst can have some artifact carbon in it, no matter how pure it is. So you tend to have a lot more background carbon it could be up to 100 parts per billion of background carbon. So it's really hard to get really sensitive pharmaceutical results if you have that much background carbon. And then it also, UV per sulfate also has less chemical interferences than the membrane conductivity technique. So it's much more accurate. Um, membranes are highly subjective to chemical interferences. Um, any kind of chlorine ions, anything like that, will can produce either a false positive or a false negative. And the false negative is what's really scary. You might have think you actually passed cleaning validation when you didn't because you're getting some interferences and getting a false negative reading. And there's also many software workflow easing features to help the users that are directed to aid in EP 2.244. Um, we'll talk about this in the next slide, and this is why we chose the Fusion for EP 2.244 testing. All right, so let's talk about those Fusion software features. So the Fusion software has many tools for 21 CFR 11 compliance used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, this, these features include um, user account and access privileges that are secure, you have to log in. Um, you have methods, calibrations, and schedules that are all versioned. So if you change the method or anything like that, it will rev it. So if the parameters accidentally get changed or they purposely get changed, it will rev it and will ask you for a reason why you changed that method. Um, report data is secure, versioned, archived, and retrieved with audit capabilities. So, um, you know, we even have auto archive features. So, you know, you can have it back up your data every day, things like that. And then report data has electronic signatures attached. So you can actually set it up. Um, maybe, you know, your chemist in the lab runs the TOC analysis and then you can send it on to your uh, lab manager and they can actually electronically sign off on it. And that will all be recorded for audit purposes. 
Um, system history and error logs can be viewed and printed. So if there are any problems with the instrument, all that is recorded in the error log and it can be filed away in any um, system that you use for documentation. So there's also a lot of workflow easing features. Um, there's a pre-programmed QC pharmaceutical method, which is what I used. Um, for this analysis. There's also drinking water and wastewater. Um, so you have these uh, really great blueprint methods to start out with. So it takes the guesswork out of trying to develop your own method. Um, you have pre-programmed system suitability standard sets. So that will actually calculate the response efficiency in this method for you. And it will give you a very clear pass or fail um, in your report. You have auto calibration, which I use I use for this study as well, which takes a stock standard. In this case, it was a five part per million stock standard, and it will dilute it for you into serial dilutions to build that calibration curve. So you don't have to make each calibration standard solution by hand. The system will do it for you. It also has a nice feature called Intel dilution. If you have a occasional sample that's above your calibration range, which you know you can't actually calculate on something that's above your calibration range because it's un unknown if it's linear up there. Um, so what it will do is flag that sample, dilute it back down to the calibration range. It will, you know, multiply it by that dilution factor so you still get results you know, if you come in the next day or something like that. So it will automatically dilute that sample down into your calibration range for you. And then it has corrective action features. So like um, if your tech standard starts to fail, it can stop. It can actually recalibrate for you. So again, if you're running stuff overnight or you just don't have time to watch it, um, it will do that for you. So if it knows when it's time to recalibrate the system, if your tech standards are failing, things like that. Um, and then if you want to learn how to use each of these features in the 21 CFR 11 compliance, we actually have a document that shows you step by step how to use those 21 CFR 11 tools. Um, and that's linked to the slide and it's also on our website if you want to know more information. All right, now let's get to running EP 2.2.44 on the Fusion. All right, so here's the criteria it gives. It doesn't give a lot of criteria again. It's, it's kind of vague, but it's still enough to know that your system is oxidizing all those complicated pharmaceutical compounds uh, correctly. So um, EP 2.244 only gives that the reagent water must be less than 100 parts per billion. The response efficiency must be 85 to 115% which was given an, um, how to calculate that in the formula slide. So I added some of our own internal criteria just to make it a, a, you know, a little more difficult, I guess you could say. Um, precision represented by percent RSD must be less than 5% for all calibration and system suitability standards. Accuracy, so that's the amount calculated back from the sucrose in one four benzoquinone must be within 10%, and your calibration curve should have an R squared value that is at least 3.9 with a five-point calibration curve. So here are some standard preparation tips. Um, so in EP 2.244, it tells you how to make up your system suitability solution and your solu standard solution. But I had, a, to be honest, I had a little bit of difficulty weighing up such small concentrations. Um, it says it needs 0.75 milligrams of 1,4-benzoquinone and then 1.19 milligrams of sucrose per liter. So to make it easier on myself, um, I actually did it into two liters. So I weighed out twice the concentration. So for 1,4-benzoquinone, it was you know, 1.5 milligrams, just to make it a little easier. And then another thing I do recommend is, you know, if you don't want to have to make it up yourself and try to weigh out such small quantities of these analytes, 
that you can actually buy these standards pretty much from any chemical vendor, um, some, especially since they're the same ones as U, USP 643. So all your major chemical vendors usually have these already made up for you and that 0.5 ppm concentration. So that only leaves your KHP calibration standard solution. Um, and the directions on how to make that are in the Fusion manual. They're also on this slide if you need to reference them later. All right, so here's the method um, that I use. So the Fusion comes with pre-programmed methods based on their application, like I said. So I just, since this was for pharmaceutical usage, I just used the default pharmaceutical method, which is a 9 mil method. Uh, so the more um, sample volume you use, the more sensitive it, it is. So if you even need a more sensitivity, you could go up to a 10 mil method. Um, I did change a few little things, nothing major. Um, one thing I did change is I turned the UV reactor pre-rinse on. So this parameter, this just um, rinses the UV chamber, reactor chamber, one extra time. So the system is already spec to be less than 1% carryover, so it's just a little extra rinse to make sure there isn't much, especially when you're trying to get that low DI um, water result of 100 ppb. It's just nice to have. It's probably not needed. It's just something I've always kind of done. Um, a trade-off would be that it would add a little bit of um, time to your analysis time. Okay. So when I, okay, so when I went to build my calibration curve, I thought about a few things before I did it. So you need a calibration curve that at least includes 100 ppb points. If you start out something higher, you can't be certain that that DI water is less than 100 ppb if you don't at least have 100 ppb points. So, I think it's important that you have a 100 ppb calibration point on there and that you have several points in your calibration curve that are around the 0.5 ppm. So for this, I did two points above 0.5, two points below, and then a 0.5 in the middle. So that will give you a very accurate result for that 0.5 ppm reading for your sucrose and one core benzoquinone. And I like to have, for pharmaceutical applications, I like to have at least five um, points. Um, sometimes I know SFPs require seven points as well. It, you know, that just adds more time, but um, you'll get even more accurate results if you do a seven-point calibration curve. All right, so to make sure your reagent water comes out less than 100 parts per billion, here are a few tips. Make sure you're using um, AS. TM type 2, great or better, which is qualified to be less than 50 parts per billion. If you're a pharmaceutical lab, I'm sure you already have this type of water. It's also important to have, have your water supply, whether it's a reverse osmosis system or um, whatever, it needs to have preventative maintenance. I know we have somebody come in once a year and check it. Um, and also, it's probably good to do an, another internal check every couple months. You could actually use the fusion to do that and use the blank values to make sure your water is still clean. That's one way you can do it. Um, for the water reservoir that's hooked up to the fusion, I highly recommend refreshing that daily because if you wait um, you know, days before you change it out, you can have microbial growth and things, things like that that will increase the um, concentration in your DI water. Um, it's good to run a clean on the system and a blank before you run anything. The clean will rinse out your system and make sure there's no residual carbon in the pathway. And a blank will verify that your reagents are less than what they're supposed to be in the amount of carbon they have. So those are more like good practices. All right, let's get into real results on the fusion. So now that I've given you all the tips, Let's go, um, let's go find out what we actually got on the fusion for results. All right, so here is our calibration curve that I talked about um, graphed out. This is actually what the software will show you. So we have a 100, a 250, a 500, a 1, and a 2.5 ppm here. 
Um, the coefficient of correlation is greater than 3.9. So we met our internal specification for that, so it passed. All right, and here's another part of the report. Um, making sure the percent RFDs are less than 5%. Um, all of them were well under 5%. So you have your 100, which was at 3.61, your 250 parts per billion, which was 1.77%, 0.5, which was 1.21, your 1 ppm, which is 0.59, and your 2.5, which is 2.38. So that all passed our internal criteria. Again, this isn't part of EP 2.244, it's more making sure your system's running correctly and other good laboratory practices. All right, let's get into our system suitability results. So this is actually how the software um, will calculate it for you. So this is just a, a, a snapshot from a report. Um, so this is actually how it shows up. It easily shows you that it passed. Um, so it says, here's your reagent water. It came out at 40.3 parts per billion, which is well under the 100 parts per billion required for the method. Then you have your sucrose solution, which is 500 parts per billion or 0.5 ppm. It came out at 0 0.5660. And then you have your 1,4 benzoquinone, which came out at 0.5429 parts per million. So these look a little high, but remember we have to subtract out this value to calculate the response efficiency. This response efficiency is included in your report already. I calculated it out to be 95.61%, which is well within the 85 to 115% range. And all our RFDs look good. So just to prove that the system calculated it correctly, um, and to show you how it's calculated, we went through how you would hand calculate the response efficiency. So again, this is a formula given in the method. And then we substituted the values we received. And then if you calculate it out, you get 95.605, which is the same as 95.61. It just rounded it to the second decimal. So you don't have to do this by hand if you have a fusion. All right, so I also calculated the accuracy. Again, this is not required by the method. This is just an internal specification. So if you calculate it out, your 1,4 benzoquinone less reagent water is 0.5026, which is very close to 0.5 it's actually 100.52% accurate. Then I did the same thing for the sucrose. Came out a little bit higher at 0.5266. It was 105.32%. So it came well within our 10% accuracy specification that we gave it. All right. This is not, again, the part of EP 2.244. It's actually part of USP 643, but I get this question a lot. So I just wanted to answer it. You'll also see in this report there's this limit response value represented as RU, which is 525.7 parts per billion. So this is saying that sample concentrations must be less than the limit response concentration for these results to be used. So if your sample is higher than this, then this method is not validated to report it. It's not saying that 1,4 benzoquinone can oxidize higher than this. Um, I know from running USP 643 with that um, sterile water concentration that the fusion can do up to 8 ppm, but for this method, we haven't validated that. So it's saying it can only get up to this is all we actually validated. If you have a sample higher than this concentration, you can't be certain that it oxidized it completely. All right, here are some tips in case you do have trouble. I did not have any trouble using the default TOC pharmaceutical methods, but just in case, if you're one for benzoquinone, you're difficult to oxidize um, samples coming out too low, 
you know, that's telling you that you're not fully oxidizing all the organic carbon in that compound. So here's some method parameters you can play around with to help um, that oxidation in case you do have, you can increase the pre-sparge time. Pre-sparge time is the amount of time the sample sits in the UV ch um, chamber before it sparges. So it has more time to come in contact with that sodium persulfate and that UV lamp to help for a fuller oxidation. You can also increase the reagent volume. So you can add more sodium persulfate, again, to help the oxidation here. And then that's how you're um, increasing the amount of UV light and you're increasing the amount of chemical oxidizer. So that's just in case you have trouble. Um, again, with the default method, there was plenty of oxidation power to easily um, oxidize 0.5 parts per million, even of a difficult sample. All right, so here it comes to our conclusion. Um, the fusion easily passes EP 2.244 criteria, as I outlined with all the analytical results. It even passed additional internal analytical criteria that I tried to use that would be similar to most pharmaceutical labs. Um, and then to make the things simple, um, the fusion has many software features to help users, including what I show with the system suitability um, standard set that is already calculated for you with the response efficiency, and then has lots of tools for 21 CFR 11 compliance, including electronic signatures, auto archiving, um, user permissions, things like that. So if you'd like, um, if you have any questions, now is your time to put it in the chat box, and I will try to get to them, depending on how many there are. Um, in the meantime, if you're, you're typing that in, I just want to thank everyone for attending. I know it's crazy out there right now, and I just hope you guys all stay healthy and safe and employed. Um, I know it's all on our mind, but these are fun little things we can do is, you know, do these webinars together. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to listen to this webinar. Um, here are my work cited, so things I use. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a minute, and, and that time I can kind of read through the questions. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. So hopefully that means I answered all them all. If not, you know, feel free to email me. Um, if you, you know, think of a question later, my email is joy.osborne at teledyne.com. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.